Let's get, the, oh, it's, now it's working. Hi, buenos dias. Oh, I like that. Uh, so I'm going to start telling, I'm going to tell you a story, and this is a typical Silicon Valley story, and that is where I am from. I've lived in uh, San Francisco for 20 years, and in 2004, see, it's not working, there we go. In 2004, I graduated with my Master's of Fine Arts in Painting, and started my career as a painter. And I'm showing you some of my most recent pieces here. And I, this is what I thought I would do for the rest of my life. It was my passion. I taught at the college level. I taught painting and drawing. I exhibited my work around the world. And I was successful. And really, when you're an artist, being successful means that you can pay your bills. That's, that's pretty much that's what being successful is. But you're happy, you're doing your passion, you're, 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 you know, you feel like, um, like you found what you were meant to do. And so in 2011, um, I had my own disruption in my life where I had to find a job that paid better so that I could support me and my three children. And so I went out to my community of other moms, other uh, teachers, and I said, if you see anything out in the world that you feel that would uh, fit me, please let me know. And a good friend of mine was on some random blog, and she saw this ad, said, nonprofit based in San Francisco, looking for event planner, please apply, and there was just this random Gmail address. So I, didn't even, I couldn't even figure out who the nonprofit was. But I attached my resume and I sent it. And about a few hours later, I get a call from this woman, her name is Julia, and she says, hi, you know, I just got your resume, you sent it to me, I'm calling you from the nonprofit, uh, you know, can I ask you some questions before I tell you about this position? And I said, okay, yeah, sure. And she says, well, have you ever heard of PayPal? Do you use PayPal? And I said, no, I don't, I don't know what PayPal is. And she's like, okay. Have you ever heard of Facebook? And I said, no, I don't, I don't know what Facebook is. And she's like, all right, well, do you know who Peter Thiel is? And I was like, I have no idea who Peter Thiel is, okay? And you have to understand, this was my technology of the time. This is what I used, all right, which I still love. I love that sound that it makes. And it's much easier than all this AV. You know it's going to work. And it's easy to fix. You just pull the slide out, it works. And so Julia's like, okay, well, she's tells me who Peter Thiel is, and he is one of the big unicorns of Silicon Valley, the, one of the founders of PayPal, first investor in Facebook, um, has many venture capital firms that invested in every other unicorn in Silicon Valley. And he had decided to start a nonprofit uh, in Silicon Valley, and part of the arm of the Thiel Foundation was the Thiel Fellowship. And the Thiel Fellowship and you may have heard about this, is sometimes it's called 20 under 20, and that is where they give a $100,000 fellowship to 20 young adults under the age of 20 years old, and it's a two-year two fellowship, 100K, plus all the connections that Peter has in Silicon Valley, and that's really where the value is. And there was just one caveat, and that is you cannot go to college while you take this fellowship, because his thought was, you need to focus on your project, and school is, can be distracting to that, to that entrepreneurial spirit. And this started the conversation, at least in the United States, on the value of a college education, and the one-size-fits-all ideology that this is the path to success. You have to go to college to be the path to success. And he wanted, Peter Thiel wanted to start that conversation, and you have to understand, in the United States right now, there is 1.3 trillion U.S. dollars in debt. That is the debt that's, that um, young adults have and carry because of college education. And it also started the conversation on universities, uh, talking about why their educational systems are valuable. And so it was a great, um, it was kind of a, a spark to just start these conversations. And so I, I, she tells me all of this on the phone, and I come in. She's like, well, how about you come in tomorrow for an interview? And I said, okay. I come in the office, sit down. Peter walks in, 
hi, shook his hand, great. When can you start? And I was like, well, what's the job? <laughs> you know, like, I had no idea. I didn't even ask, like, how much. It was just, well, what do you want me to do? And, like, we want you to be creative. That's your job, be creative. That was it. That was my job description, be creative. Help us think outside the box. They didn't want to hire anyone who knew anything about Silicon Valley. They wanted to hire someone who could come in and just be creative and add a different conversation to the brainstorming sessions, to everything. And so I was like, great. And honestly, from the point that I sent the email to when I started was less than a week. And granted, that's not a typical Silicon Valley story, but what I want to uh, convey to all of you is think about who you surround yourself with. And think about, do you have someone in your life who maybe doesn't think the way you do? So at the same time, uh, while I was there, Peter was writing his book, Zero to One, and, uh, which is a great book. And it was wonderful to be there while he was writing it because we got to see early copies, we got to read, we got to talk, have, you know, kind of just discussions about the book. And there's one specific uh, um, quote that I want to share with you. It says, doing what we already know how to do takes the world from one to N, adding more of something very familiar. But every time we want to create something new, we go from zero to one. The act of creation is singular, as is the moment of creation, and the result is something fresh and strange. And two things pop for me pop out with this, and that is creation and fresh and strange. Because once again, it's full circle to thinking about what a creative mindset, an abundant mindset, can actually bring to the conversation. The other part is fresh and strange. Nothing interesting is going to happen unless it's fresh and strange. And you know, we, people have talked about Uber, where like in the 80s, they say, don't get in a car with strangers. And in the 90s, they say, um, uh, um, uh, stranger danger. And now we're getting into cars with strangers and in their strange cars, you know, getting candy and water from them. So creation, that is something that I can say I hold incredibly dear. Um, it is something I try to bring into everything that I do, including putting these summits together. And so I want to explain this idea of zero to one by using something that I know very well, and that is art and art history. So we're going to take a little quiz. It doesn't work unless you all answer, so let's start, okay? Does anybody know who painted this? Are you being shy or you don't know? Okay. Does anyone know who painted this? No. All right. The first one is Samson by Solomon J. Solomon. The second one, The Wave, is by Bouguereau. These two men in the mid-1800s were the most famous artists alive. Okay? Solomon J. Solomon actually won what we would call like the Nobel Prize of Art. They were, they were, they, you know, they got touched by God. They're, they sold paintings. The church gave them lots of money. They were celebrities. They were like the Beyonce of the art world. Okay? Who's this? Vincent van Gogh. You all know who he is, right? And who's this? Mm-hmm. Monet. Now, these two guys painted at the same time. And... I would say it's kind of fresh and strange at the time. We're used to seeing these images on coffee mugs, but at the time, this was considered terrible. This was awful. This was gross. How could this even be painted? Vincent van Gogh said this, had this quote, instead of trying to reproduce exactly what I see before me, I make more arbitrary use of color to express myself more forcefully. For me, that's an artist's way of saying zero to one. And my point here is, look at, we can tell by looking at art and art history what each, who each artist was looking at. So Samson, who was he looking at? But he was looking at Van Dyck. Okay, and he was saying, okay, I'm going to make this better. 
And who's Van Dyke looking at but Rubens? I'm going to try to make this better. And this is all one to end. It's just one step and making it better. One step and making it better. You can keep going. Who's Rubens looking at? He's looking at Michelangelo. Who's Michelangelo looking at? Ghirlandiando, who was his teacher. Which I couldn't find a painting. I know he painted a, um, a Samson and Delilah painting, but what I do love about this painting is that he was very focused on perspective, and that is where there's a foreground, a middle ground, and a background, and trying to get those perspectives right. And you can kind of go all the way back to Samson, where you see that's pretty much the first time where you see a foreground, middle ground, and background in a in in a um, uh, uh, in a painting with figures in it. And so I don't want to diminish what these men did. Samson actually painted this painting when he was 26 years old. I mean, can you imagine painting something like that at 26? It's unbelievable. And Bouguereau, this was actually a very, um, this was a painting that kind of caused a lot of commotion because it was one of the first paintings that was out in the public uh, focusing on a woman's body, a nude, with no context except that you're looking at a nude. There was always reason to be naked before. You're, the woman was nursing, her shirt fell off, she was a goddess. Um, but this was the first time that there was just kind of a focus on the female body. But as, think of back then, and you're looking at this, and then bam, you see this. I mean, really think about that. Again, putting yourself in that position, this is insane. This is, this is, this is nothing, like, they've n nobody has ever seen anything like this before in Western art. And so that's what I'm saying about taking incremental steps to just try to make something better. In your own life, is that what you're doing? Are you taking incremental steps to try to make something better in your business, in your work life, in your family life? Is it kind of like, okay, I'm going to cut out the carbs and everything will be better? It doesn't work like that. Like, to really disrupt, you have to look beyond that, beyond that thinking, and really think fresh and strange. And so, for the last almost three years, I have evolved to, from the Teal Foundation, coming to Singularity University, um, and running these amazing global summits, trying to educate people about exponential technologies and what those technologies can do and how you can uh, um, take those technologies and actually promote your lives, your businesses, while still making a great impact in the world. And the one thing I can say from all of the countries that I've been to, and all of the amazing partners that I've worked with, and some of the amazing conversations I've had at all of these summits, is that the idea of fresh and strange is almost normal. Like, everything that these people are thinking about, and how they live, and how they do things, is fresh and strange. And so for the, this, this is very exciting, actually, because Peru, you are closing out our 2018 year of summits. This is our last summit out of 14, so this is a wonderful place for us to, to finish off. But these were all of our summits in 2018. We're going to have probably at least 20 in 2019, Peru being one of them. And so I want to just circle back to SU and how, in my own personal journey, how I ended up there. Um, when I was at the Teal Foundation, Silicon Valley is a very small world, and I got to know a lot of people who worked at SU. And when they started doing the summits, once again, uh, I, they were looking for someone who could bring in a different way of looking at educating people, especially adults. Because it's almost more difficult to teach adults than it is children because we have a certain mindset and a certain way of doing things, and to break out of that is very difficult. So, Singularity University is, is wonderful in that it's kind of this, as, as uh, Will had talked about, we're kind of a think tank and an educational institution. Um, we're, not, we're, not exact, we're not a university, like an accredited university. Um, we kind of have our hands in a lot of different pots, but ultimately, we're kind of come together in this a uh, um, stream of technology, impact, and business, and how do we bring all of those things together to make impact, which you're going to hear a lot more about after my talk. We have 21,000 alumni representing 110 countries, and congratulations to all of you. You are all alumni. 
congratulations. And seriously, yes, you are part of our community now. Really, you are. You are part of our community. And congratulations on that, because with that comes... Look, I got chills. Seriously, I got chills. <laughs> with that comes so much. It really does. Uh, we'll talk later about how you can work with the SU, with headquarters, how you can reach out to people here in Peru and in South America, but you are part of this huge community here of people thinking fresh and strange. So I'm going to end my talk by telling you another story. Uh, about a month ago, uh, I and several speakers went on safari right before we had our South Africa summit. And here you recognize David Roberts was there, Natana, who will be speaking later, Stacy, who will also be speaking later, um, and we also had some of our other partners from uh, Thailand, they were there, and we all went on this safari. And kind of like going to Couscous, it's a, just one of those life-changing experiences, and I'm proud to say I'm going to go to Couscous right after this summit. I'm very excited about that. And I think maybe in my next talk, I'll bring up that trip. But what, what happened was we all, you can see those trucks in the background. So we went out on a three o'clock safari tour. We all get in the truck. And this is where you go out at three o'clock, you see the animals, you watch the sunset, and then they take you back to the lodge. So we're out there, and lucky enough, we see a pack of lions, um, several female lions, one male lion, a bunch of little baby cubs. And it was just like, wow. I'm, and I'm seriously like, where this front row is, where I am, that's where the lions were. So it was just one of those amazing experiences. We see the sunset, we start making our way back home, or to the lodge, and within a snap, it starts hailing. And the worst kind of hail I could possibly imagine. It was the size of marbles, to the point where that evening, which I did survive, as you all can see, that evening I had little dots all over my body of bruises from this hail hitting me and hitting all of us. It was incredibly violent. And at first, it's like, wow, this is cool. And then after being stuck in the truck for over an hour, being bombarded by hail, and really, you can't leave the truck. We just saw lions. We're not getting out. We're staying in this truck, right? And it was, you know, at first you have all these feelings kind of going through, like, oh my God, we put blankets over us. Um, it, it, was, it was actually, you know, just one of those very odd experiences in one's life. Our driver and guide finally just said, forget this, and he just starts driving, not being able to see anything. Thankfully, we got back to the lodge. We all run in. We're soaked, we're kind of laughing, we're kind of crying, we're overwhelmed. We get there to the lodge, and they're all holding up the doors, hoping that nothing will blow in. There were glass tables all around the lodge, they were all broken um, by the glass. And we finally, we go change, we put on warm clothes, we go back to the lodge to eat dinner, and we're all sitting at this long table, and what do we do? but talk about what we had all just gone through. Honestly, we were there for close to three hours, longer than the time that we were out there, just discussing what had just happened to us. And when you think about it, we all went through the same thing. So why are we all talking about it? Why do we keep bringing it up? And let me tell you, I saw David Roberts here for the first time, Natana for the first time, Stacy for the first time since this trip. And what do you think the first thing we did? We started talking about the safari and the hail because we had that in common, that experience in common. And so I was stepped back and I was watching this table and all of us discussing back and forth about what we had all just been through. And I was like, why do we do this? And what I learned from that conversation is people did not have the same experience that I did, the emotions that I did while we were out there. They had different reactions. They had different thoughts went through their head. And I got to know all of those people that much better because of this experience and understanding how they reacted to the experience, not just living through it together. And so that is what I want to wish to all of you. But no hail, okay? <laughs> Here, this is an experience. You will hear some absolutely amazing talks that are going to make you think in ways that you've never thought before. 
And really, the way to magnify that experience is to talk to other people, talk to your neighbor, talk to your friend, talk to the students that are here, and see how they have reacted to some of the talks that they're hearing here, because that, will, I'm sure, will be incredibly enlightening. So, to leave you, I love this slide. Embrace the fresh and strange. Embrace this experience. Have many, many conversations, and have an absolutely wonderful time. Thank you so much. And please, I'd love to talk to all of you. So I'll be out there during the breaks, and I'd love to talk to all of you. Thank you very much.